Good morning to everybody. I am Adam Lupel, IPAD Vice President. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this special online conversation, a year in the life of an elected member, lessons learned from the Security Council. Greetings to the uh, ambassadors and colleagues around our, our virtual table and to uh, everyone watching online on multiple platforms. This event marks the occasion of the English language publication of With an Orange Tie, a year on the Security Council by Carl von Oostrom, permanent representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations. The book chronicles the historic election of the Netherlands and Italy to a shared term on the Security Council and the diligent preparation and resolute pursuit of priorities by the Kingdom of the Netherlands on the Council while serving for just a single year in 2018. The book mixes political insights about relations between the elected members and the veto-wielding Permanent Five, accessible explanations of procedural arcana, and chronicles of debates about top issues like Syria and Yemen with uh, personal anecdotes and intimate insider details revealing secrets, such as which are the most comfortable seats around the Security Council table? Or when are you allowed or not to have a snack during deliberations? And more seriously, what are the unwritten rules that reinforce the dominance of the permanent five? Indeed, this theme of the relation between the elected members, the E10, and the permanent five is a recurring one in the book. Carl sets out to put his experiences down on paper, uh, on a, on a paper in, in part, yes, it's very clear, uh, to speak to an audience back home, to make the case for uh, why uh, the Dutch time on the council was in the Netherlands' national interest, to make the case for multilateralism to a domestic audience, but also so that all newly elected member states from countries all over the world can make use of the knowledge gained over the course of the year on the council to be better prepared and to make the council more effective, which is in everybody's interest. Um, and that really is the goal for this conversation today. Since the Security Council elections were moved uh, from October to June in 2016, all elected members uh, have benefited from the additional time to prepare. And so we'd like to see this conversation as part of that process of preparation. Those of you around uh, our virtual table know Carl quite well, but for the benefit of our broader audience online, allow me just a few final words of introduction. Ambassador Carl von Oostrom has been permanent representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations in New York since 2013. Prior to that, he was Director General for Political Affairs in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. And between 2006 and 2011, he was Foreign Policy and Defense Advisor to the Prime Minister. A career diplomat for almost 30 years, he has held numerous positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including as Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassy in Beijing, which uh, provided for an interesting perspective on the Security Council visit to Beijing in 2018. Uh, one of the many engaging stories told in the book with an orange pie. Uh, Carl, welcome. Thank you and the team at the Netherlands Mission for being such great friends and partners to IPI over the years. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Carl will speak for uh, just about 10 minutes with the use of, of some slides. Uh, and then I might take the opportunity for a, a couple brief reactions but then we will open it up for discussion right away with the uh, great uh, group that we have around our virtual table. Uh, and with that, Paul, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam, for those very kind words. And thank you to you, your team, and IPI for organizing this and 
thank you for all my friends who have gathered here around this virtual table from uh, other permanent missions uh, from the press and from think tanks for joining us. Um, as you mentioned, I wrote my version in Dutch of my book uh, to explain why the Dutch taxpayer paid my salary in the past years. Um, but so many of you asked me, well, can you, can't you make an English translation? I profited from the COVID times to, uh, to do that. And doing that, I realized that I had a very political purpose in having it translated. And maybe, uh, John, you might start the first, uh, first slide uh, when, when, we, when we begin now, which is to give forward, um, to give forward to the new and aspiring elected members in the council in preparing for their membership. And in that way, make the elected ten stronger. Uh, the permanent members uh, of the council have their own consistent buildup of their archives of their experience. Uh, but the elected members, it's a, I think in general, once in a lifetime event. And by making the E10 stronger, I feel very strongly we also try to, to make the multilateral system stronger. And uh, I hope that other colleagues will also um, write their books. Um, I know that Mansour from Kuwait has written a book. It will be in Arabic. Uh, I, I really hope you will have it translated to Mansour. I think it will benefit for all of us. And one disclaimer in the story I'm going to tell is uh, my experience is based on 2018. And I, I do realize that COVID has changed the way that uh, the council currently functions. So I'm, I'm really, it's a big pleasure that uh, Rhonda King of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Johnny uh, from um, Indonesia are here who are now in the council. So I hope you will be willing to join the conversation, explain a little bit in, in what way it's now different than it was two years ago. Uh, the structure of my introduction of about 10 minutes is quite simple. I have 15 concrete recommendations for future elected members. They're practical, they're concrete, and I hope that those gathered around the table, both from think tanks and the press, will follow suit with, with transfer of knowledge and experience. So we start with the first slide, please. It's called the hamster syndrome. Um, and my first advice is claim enough diplomats from capital. If you look at the numbers of the council since 1990, roughly speaking, the load work has tripled. And compared to 2020, 20, 2000, sorry, 99, 2000, the last time we were in the council, it has doubled. There are many more meetings, there are many more uh, products, uh, there are even visits now, and both the organs and the uh, peacekeeping operations, they have roughly tripled. That means an enormous workload. Um, so you need enough colleagues from capital, um, have enough people, uh, and there's one hidden uh, uh, nugget in my book, I never realized it, but the average speaking speed of colleagues in the council has also almost doubled in 20 years time. And poor interpreters, uh, how can they cope? So first claim enough people. A second slide, please. The agenda of the council is overloaded. Formerly, uh, it's 69 items. Uh, and there's a big difference in between what we talk about and what our products are. This is a very nice word cloud. These are two word clouds which are available on the Security Council website. This is about 2018. You see that in 2018, we spoke the most about Syria. And if you look down in bottom right where our products were, our resolutions, our statements, Syria isn't even in there. So there's a difference between discussions versus results. And if you look at this, I think also if you look Middle East uh, peace process, including the Palestinian question upper left, and which is not there at the, at the bottom right, I think the basic conclusion is, is if one of the P5 uh, member states is involved or very close, closely connected to an issue on the council's agenda, then the chances of the council coming to uh, agreement are, are slim indeed, which is, which is a pity and uh, certainly a bit of frustration I felt when I was in the council. Uh, basic thing here, prepare for the iron workload. Let's move to third, the third slide. We've prepared ourselves uh, based on a, um, uh, on a very simple model. Uh, and uh, so why are we member? What do we want to achieve? How to work? When are deadlines? Where will it happen? Who will do the work? And like things like IT and housing. But certainly to get a common narrative amongst your team about why you want to be member, I think was crucial um, uh, because it gives a common, a common um, a narrative. And 
Adam, as you just mentioned, um, uh, the elections have moved, moved up since 2016. It strikes me that the wonderful sessions of the uh, Security Council report, the Finnish workshop, uh, even the training we give to junior diplomats, they're still towards the end of the year. Whereas this, this slide and, and working early and basically, many, I know that many of the new colleagues who were elected have already started this work. Uh, you can move that up as well. Uh, and uh, one of the things we did was developing standard operating procedures. I know that my Swedish colleague Olof uh, got very um, um, uh, almost upset that every statement I had always had three points, uh, but it made at least that at the outside our, our work looked consistent and having those kind of things in your standard operating procedures structures your interventions and makes you communicate better. Uh, I talked about the RM workload. Let's go to the next slide. Um, if you don't have clear priority in your term, you get lost. Uh, you're just swamped up by this RM workload. And I pay tribute to Lithuania, who uh, six years ago, they focused for two years on the protection of journalists in conflict zones. Uh, a key element, why? Because if you have uh, journalists safely working in conflict zones, that's in itself uh, a stabilizing factor because it means that mass atrocities can't keep uh, can't keep uh, hidden. And Luxembourg worked for two years in children in armed conflict, and they also had a good resolution. And we had our hunger and conflict resolution, our action for peacekeeping initiative, and accountability issues. But make very clear priorities. Also have a narrative uh, to your colleagues back home. Uh, next slide, please. No doubt your teams are already at the moment are uh, concerned about their personal well-being in the two years to be in the council. Uh, uh, the story is going around in New York about working day and night and in weekends uh, they, they intimidate all of the colleagues. Uh, be aware of that and make if you look at your planning for the two years make sure that the, the, the health and well-being of your colleagues in your team is, a, is an issue in itself, is, a, is deliverable. Uh, and I write in my book about our late uh, colleague from Cote d'Ivoire who passed away uh, during the year we were in the council. And uh, for me, he's, a, he's been with me ever since because I realized how hard he worked. And also now I would like to pay tribute to, um, uh, to him uh, and, uh, and his memory and, uh, and his team and how difficult it was for his team and his successor, Leon. Thank you for joining us, uh, for having that happen. Make sure that you have, a, uh, as I mentioned, here, Mansana in Corpo Sano, uh, a healthy mind in a healthy body. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the most difficult things in the council are procedural challenges. And so my advice, and that's number six, is make sure your team knows the procedures of the council inside out. But also make sure your team is connected to Lorraine and Karen, who are here with us today. Uh, both are experts on uh, the functioning of the council and certainly Lorraine, who's the, uh, I think you used to work in the Security Council Affairs Division uh, with your um, uh, report uh, and your website, you're a source of enormous knowledge. Um, and let's not forget, if things get difficult in the council between permanent members when it comes to procedures, the Security Council Affairs does a step backwards. They don't want to be caught in between uh, the, the, the big giants who are fighting. So you need, an, you need expertise and certainly Lorraine, uh, you help us so much at the time. And the second advice, and that is if you look at the picture in the center of the screen, this is the Russian presidency when they had the enormous procedural uh, uh, problem with the US. Um, this is not the way to do it. If you have a procedural challenge, um, suspend the meeting and go into the consultations room and solve it inside the inside of the room because this is this doesn't work. Next slide, please. Adam, you mentioned the unwritten rules of the. I, I see that made a Freudian mistake in writing UN written rules. I meant okay. unwritten rules. Uh, the unwritten rules of the council are bizarre. So um, it's not allowed to bring in a cup of coffee. Nikki Haley, the first time she came into a meeting in the consultation room, she was stopped because it's not allowed to bring coffee in. Uh, if you're hungry, Peter Wilson, uh, at the time DPR of the UK, now uh, ambassador in Holland of the UK, uh, he began eating a sandwich because he has, had missed his breakfast. Um, the meeting was stopped. 
And the third, the windows are always closed and it was not allowed to, um, uh, to take off your jacket, even if it was very warm. So you have to break those rules to show the permanent members that you own the room and that you are part of the council. So um, uh, Olaf, I pay tribute to you because you opened up the uh, curtains in the consultation room during your presidency. Under your presidency, together with my Polish and British colleague, for the first time we took off our jack jackets. And lo and behold, during the German presidency last year, uh, they opened up the curtains in the security council room. This is all very symbolic because it shows that uh, there's a world outside of the council, but also it can get very hot at the UN uh, because the airco is uh, at a high temperature because uh, of uh, the climate change. So being able to take off your jacket, I, I still hope people do that. And Johnny, of course, you have your uh, wonderful batik shirt, so that's not has never been an issue for you. Next slide, please. My eighth piece of advice is to advise is to invest in personal relations. Um, uh, I see in the upper left uh, picture, this is the trip to Afghanistan where Kairat from uh, Kazakhstan and I, we celebrated our birthday with a glass of Dutch champagne, which is uh, sparkling water. Um, personal relations are important to solve issues. Um, of course, in the end, capital decides what we do, uh, but if you don't invest in personal relations, they might have negative impact on the work of the council. Make sure that you work together, that you have a, a, an intimate relationship, and also try to have a little bit of fun every once in a while, because the stress of being on the council is uh, with the horrible issues we have to deal with uh, can, be, uh, can be very high. And the upper right, this is in Sweden during the retreat we had in the Dark Hammerskjöld Foundation when we had um, a song we sang together, and the text of that, including a poet of uh, Minister Wallström, is, uh, is in my book. Maybe the next slide. Um, one of the, for me as a civil servant, I've always worked behind the scenes. Um, I, I was never exposed to, uh, to the media. Uh, and if you look at the left, where you see both Pamela Falk and Margaret Bashir uh, with about 100 other journalists um, wanting to interview me as chair of the sanctions committee after a meeting with Pompeo, dealing with the press for me was the, the most difficult thing. Really, I, I had to learn a lot. Um, it can be quite intimidating. Uh, and at the same time, working with the press was crucial because the press is one of the ways to connect what we do in New York with what happens on the ground. It's in itself important that the outside world knows what we're doing, but if, um, if the press reports about um, uh, a resolution or a decision on Kosovo, it means immediately that is front page news in Kosovo itself, whereas in most of our countries, it, it, wouldn't, it would not even end up in one of the uh, later pages in a newspaper. But the press is crucial. The per Permanent members play with the press. They have uh, most of them have regular press briefings of the record. Do it as well. And when you come into a meeting, have a press takeout. Just tell them this is what we're talking about. This is what we think. And afterwards, be open. Certainly, if you're president, about what has happened. Uh, and that's also why I'm so happy that uh, Pamela Falk, Margaret Bashir, and uh, James Bayes have joined us. And I'm looking forward to hear from you later on how you see the interaction between the press. And the, and the council. And of course, social media uh, is also a wonderful way to connect directly with, uh, with the world, but also certainly with your own constituency. Maybe in the next slide, uh, my 10th piece of advice, um, make sure that what you do in New York has impact on the ground. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In the picture you see on the left, um, the pictures from Syria, the, the horrible Caesar pictures of mass atrocities in Syrian prisons. My biggest frustration in 2018 was that it was not possible to refer uh, the, the killing of more than 500,000 people in Syria to the International Criminal Court or to a special tribunal. Uh, at the same time, on the right, you see uh, our visit to MONUSCO, where the command, we worked very hard with all members of the council to make peacekeeping operations more effective. And when we came there, he thanked us in the council and he said, uh, because of the work of the council, I'm not counting bodies in anymore, I'm saving lives. And that's why uh, I joined the UN. So uh, realize that also when you make a, a narrative towards your home audience, make sure that you explain that what, you, what we do in New York is relevant on the ground. And we do have an impact if we're united. Next slide, please. 
Um, this is the total number of subsidiary organs of the council. It's around 30 months. One of the most bizarre thing in the past uh, years has been that the permanent members have taken up the PEM, uh, exception uh, uh, maybe on uh, cross-border humanitarian aid uh, and Afghanistan, and that uh, the, the, the heaviest workload uh, of chairing the subsidiary organs is with, uh, with the elected members. Um, we've tried to change it. We didn't succeed. I know that Germany uh, held out last year, uh, two years ago, on that one as well, to the new one who have been elected. Make sure that the permanent ones also get a bit of this workload because they have time to do it. And then you get a question, is it allowed for DPR to do it? Yes. But the division of labor at this moment is unfair because certainly the subsidiary organs, it eats up your time and it means that you don't have enough time for your priorities, uh, which you have set for your time. At the same time, you can have a lot of impact uh, in your subsidiary organ. I'm convinced of that one. And pick up the pen. Gerard van Bohemen, our former New Zealand colleague, said, just do it. Nike rules. You can pick up the pen. New Zealand picked up the pen on Jerusalem in uh, illegal, Ill illegality of settlements, and he got the Jerusalem resolution uh, in 20, I think, 14. I, I forget when it was. You can do that as well. If, if a permanent mem member tells you you're not welcome, you cannot pick up the pen, of course you can. Uh, it, it, it doesn't say anywhere that you cannot do it. Next one, also one which is very close to my heart. Next slide. When our friends who were elected in June uh, were welcomed by the permanent members, they all said a, uh, that new non-permanent members had been, had been elected. Don't accept that. You're the elected ones. Anytime that a, non, that a permanent member tells you you're a non-permanent member, you tell them, ha, if I'm non-permanent, you're non-elected. So you're non the gear is you're the elected 10. And certainly, uh, thanks to uh, the colleagues you see in the picture below to the right, uh, uh, we really try to move that needle. And what I hear back from the council, it's still happening that way. And just do it. It's quite simple. If you hear that the Secretary General has a monthly luncheon with permanent members, you host a luncheon with the elected 10. Uh, and he, of course, he will come. Uh, if they have their own meeting room, which they have to the left of the council, well, there's a wonderful uh, meeting room to the right of the Security Council, the, the NAM meeting room, and you can plot and uh, make your coalition there. So your elected members will be proud of it. Then my last slide. All of this is in my book. If you visit my website, you can see how you order it in Barnes & Noble. Uh, so I hope you read it. I hope uh, my last, my 14th piece of advice is, um, which really I felt very strongly, every day when you're in the council, take 30 seconds, usually I did it after, after I had spoken, and endure for 10, 20, 30 seconds that you can and are allowed to do this work. It's unique. You make a difference for humanity, for peace and security in the world. And it's a privilege. And my last advice, of course, is take notes and write a book. Thanks you so much. Adam, over to you. Great, thanks. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, problems with online events is you don't get to applaud. So uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Carl. There's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. And also, I think one of the things that comes out very strongly is the, the, um, the tremendous burden on new members as they come in um, as you say, going through the increasing workload, the need to um, uh, stay focused on the division between discussions and having real, being focused on really having an impact and how you do that through planning and, and prioritization is, uh, is all really, really important advice. Um, I, you know, I, we had discussed before the event, I have a few, a few questions related to my uh, reading of the book, but, but I think I'm gonna hold back. We've got an incredible group around, around the table and I'd like to get people in, involved as quickly as possible. As we discussed um, previously, if you wanna take the floor for people around our virtual table, please use the raise hand function, which you find in the, in the participants uh, on the bottom of your screen. Um, Carl already called out a, a, a few people, um, Rhonda and, uh, and Johnny as current members of the Security Council, and Carl is interested in thinking about um, how COVID has impacted all this, and do you see, do you recognize the current situation in what he is discussing? Um, I think 
will will probably still be in this context uh, to some degree when the incoming uh, members come in. Uh, what advice to you uh, to them do you have? Um, we also have around around the table uh, several colleagues that were with Carl in 2018, um, and so reflections as well uh, on that year and and uh, and how you you see uh, Carl's presentation and, and the, the the year in the council then. Um, we also have some great external expertise around the table for those uh, who are watching online who don't see. We've got Maureen Sievers here, who literally wrote the book on, on uh, Security Council procedure that, that Carl mentioned, but we also have uh, Karen Langren of Security Council Report and Dispensable uh, Reporting Mechanisms on, on the council, and, and uh, Richard Gowan, I, I see here, from Crisis Group. Um, and we have uh, members who are are running for the council as well as uh, those that are coming into the council. So a lot of uh, um, expertise and experience around the table. Um, if I can, um, uh, can I go? I know Johnny has to leave a little bit early. So uh, can we go to you first, Johnny? Is that uh, is that okay? Um, and thanks for giving me the floor because I. I have uh, uh, another appointment with the section on the, our presidency. We're going to take the presidency on August. Uh, so we um, need to discuss a lot of issues. Uh, and that also goes to your question. Uh, but before that, just to say uh, thanks uh, to Carol. Uh, I think you've, uh, you've uh, actually elaborated all of the things that I'm going to say. So I'm not going to focus uh, on that, but I'll just focus on the question that Adam is asking, which is on, on how we are doing in, in terms of COVID. But one thing that uh, an advice to, to future uh, incoming members, um, uh, there are many good words that Carol uh, alluded to, which I completely agree. The first point is uh, you've got to learn from past mistake and past success story. And that you can only do through all the colleagues that has been there before you, uh, which I see Kaira there, I see all of, I learn from them. I learned their, their success story. Of course, Carol, including in the campaign process also, I, I learned all of their tricks, uh, their, their success, uh, and we have to uh, juggle your team uh, accordingly, simply because um, maybe you don't have as many resources as other countries. But but the most important part that I think uh, the message has to be uh, get through to the capital is that to change the cultural mindset of people back home, because they tend to believe that it's is still the same thing ten years ago when we were in the council, or even five years ago. The world has changed considerably. The method has changed. Uh, well, Lorraine book is still valid in many ways, but they have to adapt to, to it. Uh, I mean, like Carol mentioned, there are three times as many resolution, meetings times and everything. And now with COVID, uh, Carol's point on having an eight hour sleep, uh, I must say in our case, maybe four hours is good enough. Because now with COVID, uh, our problem is that uh, for country like Indonesia, we have 12 hours of differences. Uh, Rhonda is much easier. She doesn't have any differences, only maybe one hour. In our case, uh, when Jakarta is waking hours and we are waking hours, and they assume that with VTC, everything can be done. So there's no excuse. You can do VTC with your pajama. You can do it with your short. So you have to be on time. That's the first point. And in terms of, of doing business also, there are considerable changes now as opposed to uh, during Carol's time. We come up with a SOFA meeting, and this apparently has been a good thing simply because during COVID, that is the time that we are able to meet. We had just recently last week a retreat. Uh, uh, Russia had it in Long Island, a SOFA talk uh, retreat type of an approach. While the UN is still not able to open, we are able to have a, 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 a meeting between colleagues. Way of doing business is changed. Workload has changed. But the most important part that I would like to advise is that media and easy access of information changed considerably. In our case, we learn from the practice of Carol as well as all of us as, as others. I have to beef up my media team, uh, not only to take care of my uh, all the press and journalists in New York, but also to take care of all the social media, Instagram, Twitter, all of those things that has never been done in the past. Because Indonesian constituency will be looking at that more than they will be looking at press release. And in times of con uh, COVID, this is becoming more and more important because we cannot convey the news uh, uh, out there without using all these uh, gadgets here and there. The other point is that there are now direct attention from domestic constituencies. 10 years ago, they might not be, they will be looking of uh, mainstream uh, newspaper, but now just like that, 
any one of our colleagues can tweet us, and that is being catched by my media back home or my my brother or my sister, and they immediately ask questions. So we cannot have any uh, possibilities of making any mistakes, small as it may be. Everything is accountable. Everything becomes transparent in many ways. In terms of COVID, another thing that we are not able to do, uh, Carol, is huddling, like you mentioned, between Russia and US. So huddling in the chambers uh, together and discussing all these kind of things. So we have to divide a lot of things. To be frank, I'm working with ten, uh, three gadgets, sometimes five gadgets. At the same time, I look like a DJ. I look like a computer geek. And I develop a, a, a trick, uh, uh, for instance, that if you use Zoom, you're able to have your face there, but actually you're talking uh, on a different uh, gadget here and there. Today I'm using one gadget just for this, but usually I'm using three gadgets because you can't, you have to continue the lobbying part. I'll give a simple example. Also the difficulties that Geraldine and Juan Ramon, as well as others and, and Firu will be uh, experiencing is the issue of trying to broker consensus. We have to continue using the phone from one party and to the others back and forth. Uh, and that we are doing also while we are having the normal meeting through BTC. So this is another another uncharted territory and Rhoda can, uh, can, uh, can agree with me on this is also the question of there are no rules that even the Lorraine book does not decipher on how we do things on BTC. This is a difficult part. It took us another one month just to decide whether we can have a VTC because this creates legality, this creates precedence. Some P5 doesn't like it. Some doesn't want to have it because it would continue to be a problematic. While at the same time, the world is looking at us as if we are not doing anything. As actually, we're doing a lot of things in the council. But the question, this is one thing that we have to juggle again. Another issue that is something that I think would be important for, for you, Adam, as well as colleagues, is that the rules in the subsidiary body are quite different also. They have several additional rules and that cannot be settled in terms of PTC. We were the first one as chair to, to sort of push for a meeting of the subsidiary body for 1267, which is ICE Al Qaeda issue. But even then it's called informal, informal, informal. So because there is this thing of confidentiality, the, the, the last point that I want to say is that you have to be adaptive, you have to be creative, you have to be innovative. And one thing for sure, I agree with Carol also, that the world has changed. Uh, the, the notion that the e tank cannot do anything, I think that's, we, we prove in COVID uh, on, on issues of procedurals, and there are a lot of procedurals now being uh, set up in the COVID in terms of decision making, in terms of voting. It takes nine votes to get things through, and you cannot veto it. So that's where the E10 is now making a difference in many ways, because we are together, we are we're having a lot of meeting within ourselves, and we're able to address. Last point, uh, I'm sorry if I'm taking along, just to, to, to underline once again, not only to be innovative and adaptive during this COVID, but I think this is a time where you have to make compromise, and the compromise is much more harder than in normal circumstances, because we, we cannot whisper to each other ears, we have to make sure you when you text something, then you are afraid also of the confidentiality. Uh, you have to call and those kind of things. The, the one thing that I think people should not forget is that the council is master of its own rule. This is one thing that people tend to forget. And one thing that I cannot understand is the rules of procedure have always not been formalized until now. And this is one thing that we have been, uh, it's a pro professional rules of procedure. This is what Ro Ro Lorraine as well as Scott as well as other teachers. My simple question is, why is it professional? Why can't you have a formal after 75 years of the United Nations? So because of that, we are master of its own rule. And I also would like to add my word, we are also master of our own destiny. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about COVID, the destiny of the non-permanent member is us to decide where the council must go. So sorry with that, if I took a lot of time. And once again, congratulations, Carol. I look forward to the Indonesian version of that. And, and, and I have used my orange uh, tie in all of your meetings, uh, so to say. Uh, with that, thanks so much, colleague, and uh, stay safe. And once again, uh, to the incoming member, uh, uh, what do you call it in English? Don't wish what for it. Don't ask for what you wish for. It's <laughs> headache. It's a lot of work. It's crazy. So you take a lot of vacation before you come in. Hallelujah. <laughs> Very good, very sound advice there. Master of own rules, master of destiny. Keep that in mind. Take vacation before you start. 
uh, excellent. I've got a I've got a great uh, list. We've got I've got uh, about seven people already on the list, uh, but I wanted to give Rhonda a chance since uh, since Carl mentioned you. Rhonda, did you want to take take the floor? Uh, follow up on some of uh, Johnny's points about the current session. Um, thank you, um, Adam. And first of all, I also want to, since we are um, streaming live, I want to uh, congratulate Carol again publicly for, for this initiative, not just convening this meeting, but for writing that book. I think we need more of those. Um, and the our incoming um, colleagues are at an advantage because of it. And I'm happy to know that Mansoor is doing likewise. So um, kudos for that. Um, before I came here today, the, the Guardian had an, a, an article, I don't know if you saw it. The article says, um, what is the future of the UN in the age of impunity? As the laws of um, um, of war become optional and crimes in Syria and Libya go unpunished, there are fears the body has no teeth. That's what they are saying about um, the Security Council today in the, in the Guardian, the UK Guardian. So that is a backdrop. I wanted to debunk something. I've heard many criticisms of the, the, the council about it not being able to do its work that we have been slow to get started. And there were, so, um, so I will touch on that, Carol, about how the council has been working. I do not agree that the council was late and dragged its feet necessarily in starting to do its work. It took two weeks. During that two week period, from the time that we, the, we last met in the council to the time that we were actually adopting um, resolutions, two weeks had elapsed because during that period, the PCs were testing the platform. The problem was the, um, the antiquated um, system that, they, that this, they, um, they, the UN had because it wasn't needed. So it, it hadn't updated its system. So, um, so we have had to, we, the PCs were working round the clock, testing and testing. And at the end of the end of that first month, we were able to devise a new um, working method of writing in our votes um, to adopt. So let me give you some statistics that during the, the um, in June, for instance, we had 50 VTCs compared to 44 um, council meetings last year. We have had 170 VTCs since the 24th of March. And the number of resolutions adopted is almost identical for the, the same period of time. So um, in terms of the council being able to continue, it has been. We have been working um, around the clock. Now, with respect to the SNAP, because we are now at home, we do get to snack in our, in, um, we can discreetly um, snack on, um, on, uh, for closed meetings, but we are cognizant of the fact that in open meetings, we are being streamed live. So we, we drink water or sometimes we see cups like Mansoor is doing now, we will do a cup of coffee. So, um, so that's one good thing from, from um, meeting um, um, on VTC. Now, another thing that um, you said, Carol, that in your day, you encouraged that um, when we, the SG was meeting primarily with the, 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 um, the um, P5, we, the E10 didn't meet with him regularly, but now you, you know, you didn't mention it and, and Johnny didn't, that we meet with the um, SG on a monthly basis for lunch. Even during the, um, during the COVID lockdown, we have um, very spirited discussions with, um, so we have a virtual lunch meeting, it's done in the same, in the same slot. So we meet with the SG monthly. We also meet with the SG as the, as the 15 
And um, so, and, and, but our discussions as E10 are quite spirited with the, with the SG. So, um, so that's um, a change because that is now a re regular meeting. Every single month, we have that meeting with the, um, with the SG. But I don't want to go on too much longer because we have so many people speaking. If I see that there's something else that I could, but I wanted to debunk the myth though, that the, the, the council was not, was lagging behind, was not working. The council is working harder. Now you can quibble with its effectiveness. Th that, that hasn't changed. <laughs> so it, uh, it, it, isn't, it is no more effective. It is certainly, um, that, that's another discussion. But in terms of, of, of meeting and trying to get its work done, adopting mandates, um, the, the council has not missed a beat in, from my in my estimation. But effectiveness is another um, another discussion altogether. So I will um, I will stop here and um, and okay. see the floor to the next. Beautiful. Thank you so much. We've got uh, I've got about twelve people on our list. So uh, so yeah, I'll have to uh, we'll we'll have to try to limit our limit our comments from here on out. For the next few, I've got Kairat, Olaf, Geraldine, and Francisco, and then uh, Ad, Juan, Ramon, James. Richard, Amira, Karen, and uh, Bessiana on, our, on my list so far. So please, um, Kyra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Excellencies, my colleagues, uh, it is a very uh, pleasant moment. And of course, I would like to congratulate Carol with his book. Uh, it's a very interesting name with an orange tie, which we really observed him uh, wearing it uh, all the time. And, uh, I think it's a very excellent uh, title of the book. Uh, you know, this meeting is bringing us back to all this, uh, you know, tense and challenging times at the Security Council. I think it's an uh, interesting thing, which uh, I would like to observe, uh, is that probably uh, the way of working of the Security Council changed because of the COVID but the essence of it doesn't change. It's all the time when elected 10 would like to, to make a difference uh, because they kind of feel the responsibility uh, uh, on their shoulders from the rest of the uh, I mean, uh, General Assembly. And P5 is more conservative. They don't want to change uh, the rules. Uh, and we have all this uh, battle going on uh, up till now. And of course, this is the uh, uh, sometimes problematic uh, for the Security Council to achieve uh, the results which we are talking about. Uh, talking about books, uh, uh, there is uh, one more. Of course, uh, we also published uh, a book about our experience uh, in the Security Council. And uh, this uh, book has already been uh, released in Kazakh and Russian languages, and uh, hopefully the English version will be out soon. And uh, of course, each country, I think, has a unique experience uh, being in the Security Council, and it has its own ideas how to uh, change the work or make it more efficient uh, in, in dealing in international, with international affairs. I think it's very important to do that. And uh, just uh, having a chance to uh, congratulate my dear colleagues, the permanent representatives uh, of India, Ireland, Kenya, Mexico, and Norway as uh, for their well-deserved honors to be uh, next in the uh, non-elected I mean, members of the Security Council. I wish them, of course, success in their undertaking, building on the specific legacies that each of the previous elected members uh, has given often in significant and historic ways. Um, of course, uh, talking about uh, <laughs> Uh, the uh, interesting moments, personal moments, uh, I would uh, again refer back to Carol's picture when we were uh, celebrating our birthdays, uh, you know, up in the air. I think it was the first time in my life when uh, I, I did that. It was a very memorable time. We were the presidents, uh, president, we had the presidency in the Security Council. It was January uh, 2018. And we all were on the board of the plane. And you know, Carol and I, we have almost identical uh, uh, time for birthday, dates for birthday. And 
our colleagues at that time, it was Sacha Laurenti from Bolivia, it was some other colleagues who decided to uh, celebrate that on the board of the plane. And you know that in that bar area, it is not allowed to be three or five people, just more than three or five people. But there were 15 people standing together uh, asking uh, for a glass of champagne. And it was 11 PRs, including Nikki Haley. Uh, we were flying to Afghanistan on this very serious mission. And you can see all these happy faces standing <laughs> with the, a glass of champagne and celebrating. It was just quite a personal moment. Uh, it will be, uh, I think, remembered all the time. Um, but let me uh, just say a few lessons learned since uh, we are talking about this. Um, of course, I know that it's an uh, uh, important thing to do because all of us are willing to, to change, uh, to, to, have, to contribute to the work of the uh, Security Council and make it more efficient. So um, I would say that, um, you know, first lesson is we need to confront polarization and we need to seek a return of trust at CBS. And, and it's not, um, you know, it's not a secret that even it was before, it is now that uh, the Security Council is very much divided, but we need to uh, really to overcome it. And we need to do it through dialogue and trust. And it's not only the building trust between member states, but primarily, uh, uh, among the, uh, the permanent members of the council. So uh, new council members, I think, uh, are called to work with a true spirit of solidarity and objectivity, overcoming narrow national interests for the cause uh, of the common global good. Um, it is very imperative today uh, that no stone is left unturned towards a progressive vision of peace and security, regardless of anything which we face there. Um, Kazakhstan, uh, during its term, 2017, 2018, has been and will continue to be committed to multilateralism, global peace building, security, and sustainable development. And we need all to serve as impartial, honest brokers uh, for mutual good. The second lesson, I would just uh, try to be uh, short, but Still, I think it's important. Uh, lesson two, it's a political will. And I think the political will is the main tool for resolution of conflicts. And I have a very clear example during our time. It was the example of the Horn of Africa. Uh, during my chairmanship of the Sanctions Committee on Somalia and Eritrea, uh, I visited uh, as a chair uh, the region uh, and uh, we met uh, uh, with the leadership of Somalia, Djibouti, and Ethiopia. And you know, Ethiopia, which really surprised us because uh, at that time it was just the time when Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed Ali, came uh, into office. And it was the first meeting of the Prime Minister with, uh, you know, any diplomats or international community. And you know, he really surprised us because he said, I'm going to extend uh, my uh, hand of goodwill to Eritrea. And that was, it was not my first visit, but usually what I heard is one of the same story that we will never change the relationship. And here we had absolutely new narrative. And uh, he requested the Security Council to help him, help him with, uh, with this. And you know, that changed the whole political landscape in the region just due to his political will. I think we, we don't have it. We need it more in today's world. And we need to work on this because the political will could really uh, contribute to positive developments uh, to lead the, to peace. And you know, the, you know uh, of course, that Prime Minister was awarded with Nobel Peace Prize in 2019. But uh, why I'm mentioning it is that we managed, because of this political will of Ethiopia, we managed to agree within the Security Council on lifting the long-standing sanctions on Eritrea. And you know, it's 
we, we all know that it is much easier to impose UN Security Council sanctions than lifting them. And uh, my delegation is proud to be part of the success of many countries which contributed towards the ending nine year sanction regime against Eritrea. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I just quickly say that uh, regional, sub regional organizations, it's very important. We have to rely on their work. Uh, we have to rely on them in the work of uh, Secu Security right. Council. Um, and the last uh, thing which I would like to say about the memories. Um, Carol, I remember uh, that when we uh, were the chair of the uh, Security Council, we introduced a new ceremony, uh, installing flags of the countries uh, in the stakeout area. And you know, that was interesting because when we joined the Security Council in 2017, it was quite a technical, uh, you know, uh, event when uh, people came, changed the flags, that's it. We were so much surprised because all our countries worked very hard to get to the uh, elected seat. And this kind of a uh, very dull ceremony was not kind of corresponding to what we actually need to, to have for uh, those countries who is becoming the uh, new elected members. And uh, the difference was that in 2018, there was not five countries, there was six countries. And the sixth country, you can imagine it was Netherlands because they were changing Italy. So that was a unique as well because it was not five, but it was six countries uh, putting flags and uh, I'm, I'm just glad that uh, uh, that uh, solemn ceremony has now become an annual tradition of the council. And uh, we are looking forward to conduct the next ceremony with participation of newly elected members of the council in January, 2021, during the presidency of Tunisia. I thank you, I'm sorry. Great, right. thank you so much. No, there's a, there's a lot there. And uh, uh, of course, we've only got about um, 35 minutes left and a lot of people want to take the floor and I want to, I want Carl to be able to have a chance to, to interact a little bit. So what I would suggest is for those members that, that sort of have this kind of list of uh, categories of, of uh, recommendations, reflections for the incoming members, for the purpose of this conversation, let's, uh, let's, let's try to prioritize on a couple and then we would, we would at IPA would be happy to collect some of the, uh, some of these to and then circulate it amongst the incoming members and, and maybe post on our, on our website if, if well to, in order to contribute to the spirit of, of preparation. Um, but we'll have to limit our, our interventions from, from here on out to, to five minutes or so, uh, maybe a little bit, a little bit less. Um, so let's just try to keep it, keep it succinct so we can um, get, get everybody in. Um, we have now Olaf, who is currently represented the EU, but during Carol's time was uh, ambassador of Sweden um, on the council with them. Olaf, you, you have the floor, please, ambassador. Yeah, thank you, Adam, uh, and um, uh, greetings to everyone. It's uh, this sense of nostalgia when I see uh, colleagues from the council around uh, in, around this group. It's really nice to see you again. I feel that I have very little to teach uh, the colleagues who are in this call, so I'll be, I'll be very brief, but I wanted to praise uh, Carol, not just for the book, but also for his ability uh, that I now understand that he was able to, in that, during that hectic year to also keep very detailed notes of everything that, uh, that, that transpired. That's, that's, I really admire that. And I also do admire, Carol, the fact that you are always extremely uh, well organized in your in your interventions and you mentioned the three points um but that you know it's it, it it sounds a little bit boring but it's actually very important because people can listen to three points but they will not listen to endless um uh, uh you know uh, unorganized uh, ways of talking like uh, myself and i i think um we had of course the 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 <laughs> The master of this was our dear colleague, Francois Delattre, our French colleague at the time, who always said, I have three points to make. And he was somehow able to put eight or 10 points under those three subheadings. <laughs> so it's a, a cheeky way of, of, of using that. Um, I think, uh, I just want to say too, that in the Swedish case, and I think Carol, you made a very important point that um, the campaign that we ran was scrutinized and debated and sometimes criticized in my country. 
uh, a country that is normally very well, you know, everyone is basically supported to the UN, etc. But all of a sudden there were questions, why, what's the point, etc. But once we were elected, I think the country came together and it's a little bit like, you know, qualifying to the World Cup or something. So all of a sudden Sweden is there on the big pitch and everyone takes an interest. So I think it contributed to um, consolidating support for the UN and for multilateralism. And that has a value in itself. Um, second or third point, uh, be well prepared. Um, it just so happened that we were president in the first month of our two year tenure. That was just a coincidence, but it forced us to prepare well. And when I say that, it isn't just about making sure you have the right people in your team. It's also about, you know, thinking early, what do we want to achieve? Because some of those achievements are based on a report by the Secretary General that usually takes a year to produce. So if you want to, if you want to prepare that, you have to prepare it and sort of lobby for it even before you enter uh, the council at some times. Fourth point, um, we paid a lot of attention to the personal responsibility. Each and every one who serves on the council as a PR, I think should come in with this personal um, responsibility for delivery, you know, not just to accept that it's you know, okay, we fail, et cetera, to never give up and to look to one's, you know, inner, you know, what, what makes me tick. When I leave after two years or one year in the case of Carl, what will I regret if I didn't do or didn't try, you know, to never give up, as I think Johnny said too, you know, this just, uh, and there are possibilities, even for smaller or, 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 or medium-sized countries. So one mustn't be shy when you come in there. Even controversial is issues, security and climate, um, women peace security, uh, human rights, uh, all of, to me very natural issues, but some of them are still controversial. Um, there is a threshold also for those permanent members who may not like these issues. They're not going to kill it every time. So it's worthwhile to just insist and, and work hard and, and, you know, maybe you don't get a resolution, but you get a presidential statement or you just, you cover a little bit more ground. Uh, but you will not do that if you're afraid of getting kicked back. Um, and, and, and that's where this other idea of building alliances and the most natural alliances among those who are in this call is the E10. We are elected, as I think uh, Carl so, so clearly expressed it, we are the elected members. We have a completely different view of the, uh, the need to deliver during that short term we're on the council. Um, and, and that makes us think differently, I think, than, than the bigger countries who sometimes can afford, the permanent members can afford to have a show to just demonstrate or, 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 or use their veto to block something, whereas we would always try to find solutions. And, and, and therefore, I think the E10 needs to stick together. And if I may you know, make a pointed remark, I think that has been lost a little bit um, the last year or so. So I want to put that to our to the to Johnny and to um, uh, Inga Ronda and others. You know, I think you need to come together because, especially at times when the big five aren't able to deliver because they are lost uh, in blockages. I think uh, Adam, since there is so many people who want to speak, I'll just um, stop there. And again, thank Carol for his uh, excellent uh, book. Very good, Mike. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, e ten needs to stick together. Important uh, message. Um, Geraldine, congratulations on the on the campaign. You were our first incoming member to take take the floor. So this is really this discussion. Carl was very keen to make this really for for you and your colleagues that are coming into the council next year. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam, and thank you so much, Carol. I have to say, I'm hanging on every word, including the contributions from all our colleagues. Fantastic, Carol. Uh, I, I was thinking as you introduced it, you sound like you're sort of channeling your inner Woody Allen, that it's everything you want to know about the Security Council, but we're afraid to ask. And, uh, and I, I'll tell you, it would be required reading for every single member of the Irish team in New York and for our task force in Dublin. The copies are already on the way there. So um, really, thank you. I think, you know, with three or four months out, what matters hugely to a country like mine is that you focus on the pragmatic practice 
practical, the nuts and bolts, but also the, the substantive policy matters. And it's sometimes making those two things come together. That can be the fearful part of it for a country. It's 20 years since Ireland was on the council. There isn't much of a folk memory of Adam. You described it as the uh, procedural arcane, yeah, but you know, also what actually works and what doesn't. So hugely valuable. So I have three quick questions because I know others are lining up. The first one, um, and Olaf began to unpack it there in his, the end of his remark, goes to the relationship, Carol, you touched on, between, between and amongst the E10 and with the P5. You know, frankly, at this stage, I just did an interview for Irish media this morning and the first thing question to me was, well, you know, there's a P5 veto. Can you really hope to do anything? My answer is always yes, because we're an elected member with the legitimacy of the whole General Assembly behind us. My question, though, and I think Olaf was, was hinting at it there, is how much does the coherence of the E10 actually matter in terms of the capacity to make a difference? And where... What, what's your advice to us going in in terms of how we can build that up? And particularly, I'm interested as to whether during your time, Carol, there were friendly P5 who actually were helpful in the coherence of the E10. So that's my first question. My second one, actually, I was very taken by all your slides, but one of your slides, the second one, pointed up a rather, I guess, shocking uh, uh, scenario where the more time you talk about a big issue, uh, maybe the bigger the chasm is in terms of actual delivery and output. What advice would you have to an incoming member now about how much of a premium we put on the deliverable concrete resolution or output, or whether you would see there's a different balance to be gained there from being an agile, effective member contributing to advance a discussion without necessarily seeing a hard product at the end. And because you always ask her three, three things, I have a third question. And that's what did you wish on the day you left the Security Council? What did you wish you'd known the day you walked in? So thank you, Carol. Thanks so much. That, that's great. What, what actually, what I'd like to do then is those are, those are very specific and, and, and important questions. What I'd like to do is then jump to our other two incoming members who are on the list, uh, Odd and, and Juan Ramon. Um, and then come back to you, Carl, for, for maybe a quick response to those questions before we uh, finish up uh, on, the, on the rest of the list. Does that sound, uh, does that sound good, Carl? Yeah. So, uh, so, Odd, please. Thank you very much. I've been struggling a bit with the internet connection, so I, can, I hope you can, all, uh, you can all hear me. Uh, thanks so much uh, to IPI for, for convening us, and, and many, many thanks to, to Carl for his uh, presentation. I very much look forward to, to, um, to read the book and will certainly uh, be joined by many others in our, in our mission uh, in doing so. Um, uh, th this kind of, this event, you know, having this sharing of experience is of course extremely important for us as an incoming, incoming uh, member and uh, uh, we are uh, all ears in terms of uh, learning how to um, um, learning from others, their experiences in terms of uh, carrying on the torch. We know that uh, there's been, uh, you know, a development over time in terms of how elected members can have, uh, can, uh, can make a difference and, uh, and influence uh, matters in, in uh, the Security Council. Um, and uh, and uh, my interest and my question is very much along the lines that Geraldine had and that partly was also covered in Olof's intervention. Um, you know, the, the sort of this dynamic between uh, elected members and, uh, and the P5. And uh, uh, joining uh, Geraldine in her question and, and adding a, another dimension is uh, maybe if we could hear a little bit of a reflection on the early stages uh, coming in as a new member uh, where there is a distribution of uh, chairmanship for the subsidiary organs. Uh, you know, the dynamics there has evolved over time and, and just in the last few years. Is there any advice as to how to, to approach this member, as an, uh, this, this question as an incoming member, uh, the dynamics between the newly elected, the dynamics within the E10 and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, P5? And then maybe also uh, if there's a reflection or two around pen holdership, pursuing, pursuing that, knowing that that's also a changing uh, landscape. Thank you so much again. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you. And then um, I'd like to turn to Juan Ramon, Mexico, also incoming into the council. Congratulations. 
Thank you, Alan. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I would like uh, first to congratulate Pearl on uh, his new book and uh, his new assignment to London as well. Uh, thank you, Carol, for sharing with us your first-hand experiences as an elected member. Uh, I think uh, you offer us very insightful perspective, and, and I thank you for that. Mexico is, is, of course, looking forward to serving for the fifth time in the Security Council, but uh, each participation is challenging as the context naturally changes and changes very rapidly. This time, however, uh, and, and would like to, to, to get your feedback because we observed an increased polarization within the council. The differences have all, always been there, but we have the impression that now they seem to be more evident. Uh, the fact that it took the Security Council almost four months to agree on a resolution to support the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire, uh, I think it's a testimony of it. Uh, uh, as an ET member, Mexico is committed to advancing the role of the E10 in the work of the Council. Uh, by the way, let me say that uh, I was very pleased that the notion of elected members, as opposed to referring to them as non-permanent, has been acknowledged by Carol as well. I think it's very important. We, we absolutely agree with that. And on the question of a better distribution of the workload in the Security Council, uh, as you said as well, uh, we're aware there are some resistances, uh, yet we don't see any reason why ET members could not be able to hold a pen or share a pen for resolutions more frequently. Uh, thank you for that advice. Likewise, the distribution of uh, chairmanship of the subsidiary bodies is something that may be better balanced between elected and uh, permanent members. Uh, I, I think we've We've had already the, the new E5 have been working on it and uh, hopefully we'll be able to come up with some uh, agreement uh, uh, as to how are we going to distribute that amongst ourselves. Uh, and we very much look forward to continuing some of these deliberations in the framework of the group that uh, our colleague uh, and fellow group like Rhonda King from uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is chairing. Uh, uh, we also think, and finally, and would like to see what you think about it, that the words that the Security Council agrees upon should make a difference on the ground to avoid precisely uh, notes as the one that Rhonda mentioned about the Guardian. The notion that only resolutions of the Council are binding, in my perspective, is rather restrictive. Other Security Council products must also have tangible impact particularly when referring to threats to peace and security. I don't know if that is possible. Uh, but as we prepare for our task, we have increased our exchanges with elected members that are serving in the council and uh, some of you that uh, have been serving recently. But we also increase in our exchanges with the Secretariat and civil society. My country will work together with the rest of the members to ensure that the council continues to be relevant and that we allow no room for the forces that call for unilateral action. Mexico will defend multilateralism and has done it for the last 75 years since the foundation of the UN. Thank you for this opportunity and again, congratulations, Carl, and best of luck in your following and delicate tasks. Thank you, colleagues. Hey, thank you so much, Ramon. I noticed earlier that um, I missed our fourth incoming member here. We have Tiru India, who's also uh, asked to take the floor. So I think uh, uh, to have all four, uh, we're just missing um, Kenya today, um, to have all four incoming members ask a question, I think would be great. So Tiru, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, for bringing us all together and thank IPI for that. And um, allow me to express my felicitations and appreciation for Ambassador Carroll for the, not just the book, but also for your uh, next assignment. Congratulations and wish you all the best. Uh, you know, it's, it, the book is invaluable, not just for uh, countries like ours, which are on the verge of getting into the UN Security Council, but for many others who are aspiring and even those who are not. I think that's really, uh, it's really an important contribution to our understanding. I found the discussion and some of the presentation, I found it really enlightening. And so, and, and I'm not asking any specific question because Geraldine has 
asked all the things which I wanted to ask. So I just wanted to say that uh, I got an excellent picture of the increase in the workload and how you know the discussions don't correlate with the outcome, for example, and the media focus, uh, the attention to the details and to reach out for compromises. I think these are all things which are very interesting for us and I really look forward to reading the book. Thank you once again for giving an opportunity. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for being brief there. So now, Carl, we've got a, we've got a choice. We've got some uh, direct questions from your incoming members. We still have another 10 uh, colleagues that are interested in taking the floor. Would you like to, to respond to a couple questions now? Would you like to wait yeah. to the end and then uh, come back? A couple I'll, 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 speak, I'll speak for one minute because it's much more okay. interesting to hear the other ones. But in right. one minute, uh, between E10 and P5, the first thing is don't be intimidated. It's a matter of mindset. Don't ask permission to pick up the pen, just do it. And if any P5 member tells you, oh, our, our rules and procedures don't allow it, just do it. Uh, it's really Gerard van Boheem and our New Zealand colleague who set the tone for that one. I, I feel it very strongly. Secondly, are all P5 the same? Um, I'm Dutch, I'm from Europe. Um, so for us, our values-based foreign policy is very close to the French and the UK. And they really have a different, um, 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 I would say, um, uh, position amongst the P5. Thirdly, what would I have loved uh, to have known at the beginning of the year? It sounds silly, but I would have loved to be able to read my book a year before. Okay. How it works in practice. Uh, it's very hard to get a feel on what is happening in the council. Um, on Ot Inga, on uh, dynamics and subsidiary organs. Uh, I see our Taye, our Ethiopian colleague is here. You were present in the Finnish workshop when we had a very difficult conversation with the P5 when the French colleague was like, ah, but then I even have more work if, if they have a chair a subsidiary organ. We fought very hard. Um, I know Germany fought very hard and maybe Rhonda, you might say later on how, it, how the current process is. I know that 20 years ago, we were just a lot of it and we were told afterwards, now there's much more consultation. And I hope there's a growth process we've seen is continuing. And then what uh, Tiro and uh, Juan Ramon said, and which I fully agree with what you said. And, and I really would like also to hear from uh, Lorraine and from James, and because I think that outside perspective is also crucial. Great. Yes, we'll do. If everyone is, uh, tries to be sharp, We'll, we'll 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 get everyone, and maybe we'll maybe we'll take an extra five uh, five uh, ten minutes if people are, are willing. Um, so on my list right now, up next, I've got I've got Francisco, um, and then James as well, and Richard, Amira, Kieran, Mansoor, uh, Lorraine, Bessiana, Vanessa, Jonas, and Tay. Um, not necessarily in that order. We can uh, we can uh, play for here. So, but first, uh, Francesco, please. Is yours. Let's go. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, and uh, so first to congratulate I, IPI and Carlo for this event. And also thanks for the insights from um, from Gianni, from Rhonda, from Kairat, and from Olof. And I'm also looking forward to read the, to read Mansour's book. I only have one question, and it's um, related with um, the presence in briefings of um, um, invited. Uh, People from the from uh, civil society and also um, from from the PBC. And what I would like to hear from you, Carol, um, and from your experience, is your impression as to what extent those interventions and advices from civil society and from B PBC are really listened to and taken into account by the by the council. And what also could be done to make those presences more effective? Thank you. Great, thank you. Great for the brief there. And now we'll go as as as, as Carl said to a couple of outside uh, perspectives. Uh, James, please. So, uh, James Bayes from Al Jazeera, representing the UN Press Corps. Um, Ambassador, in your book, you seem to suggest you were quite terrified of us, but actually you engaged much more than some of your other colleagues. Um, what seems to me always a problem from the press point of view is that although we are focusing on the same issues that the Security Council is focusing on, our news cycle is by the day, by the hour, and we don't follow your programme of work. So we're offering, often asking ambassadors about things that are, are not the things that you're discussing today. So my question is, how do you handle that? Um, I know you brought in a very seasoned press 
Secretary Fritz to help you in the in in the in the in your mission. Uh, but how do you handle that, and how trusted or empowered by your foreign? Great. I think uh, I'm at a gotten cut off. Cut off there at the end, Dan's, but I think that's an excellent question, and we'll get back. We'll, we'll uh, probably get back to that in, in a moment. Um, and let's get a couple more um, of the external perspectives. Uh, Richard, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, continuing the bearded British segment of this discussion, <laughs> which hopefully will be good preparation for London, Carol, and congratulations on your new post. Um, I actually have a question about the EU because I think it was during your year in the council that you and Olaf uh, really kicked off the uh, practice of uh, EU statements um, outside the council chamber. And I would wonder if you have any reflections on uh, the value of those shows of uh, EU coordination. Uh, secondly, how you see those adapting now uh, when we have more Europeans coming onto the council, but sadly fewer of them are actually EU members um, than was the case in the past. And finally, did you feel any tensions between your EU identity and your E10 identity? Were there moments where you sort of felt there were hard choices about speaking uh, for the EU as opposed to the E10 as a whole? Thank you. Great, thanks. Really uh, excellent concrete questions, I think. We'll, uh, we'll continue, if you don't, don't mind, with a couple of the external uh, voices here with Karen and Lorraine, and then we'll move back to, uh, to the member state uh, intervention. Uh, Karen, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Adam, and bravo, Carol, on the, on the book, which I really look forward to, to reading. And thank you for your kind words about Security Council report. And for anyone who uh, isn't aware, our uh, Security Council handbook is now available for free download from our website. I wanted to just put on the table three areas for possible uh, development. Um, not so much questions, but Adam commented, and I agree most strongly with this, about the importance of having brought the elections procedure forward, giving incoming members more time to, to get ready. It would surely be quite an easy matter not to have a newly elected member required to uh, preside over the council in January. It has happened a statistically incredible number of times in the past few years. Sweden, Dominican Republic, Vietnam, that um, could presumably be addressed to a great benefit of the incoming members. Second question around or point around how elected members are chosen where they are chosen by their regional groupings. My colleagues certainly feel that there are benefits to competitive elections also around readiness. By the time you get there, you've been making the, making the case for quite some time, including to uh, the domestic audience. Could this be perhaps um, standardized in a different way, also enabling regions or encouraging regions to give more support to their members on the council, given the different levels of uh, readiness we see among members who come in. Last point, and this is something I uh, spoke about when addressing the council open debate on working methods a couple of months ago, uh, is the question of cultivating stronger linkages between the council and the other principal organs. It's been a surprise to me to see how weak those links are with the GA, with ECOSOC, with the International Court of, Court of Justice. And yet you quite often hear some council members uh, saying that they prefer not to deal with particular issues which belong with, with other organs. So I know uh, Ambassador King also feels quite strongly say about the links with, with ECOSOC. I'd be very interested to see how those might be um, developed uh, also linked to questions about the council's council membership legitimacy, which we haven't touched on so much today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Uh, one, one last uh, excellent perspective from the, from the Dean of Procedure. Uh, Lorraine, please, if you have a brief introduction, uh, go ahead, Joyce. Okay. Um, I have so much to say about this book. It's going to be hard for me to 
contain it in a few minutes, but these Please, books- you, we, I, yeah, you guys had an exchange beforehand, and I know you're sending all your corrections to, to Carl already. Comment. Comment. So for the purposes of this, let's keep it uh, really brief, if you don't mind. Thank you. No, 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 no. I was, no, I'm going to go more to substance. But I, I think these kinds of books that really give an insider's experience are invaluable, especially since there's been a recent trend to really look at the council statistically and mainly in terms of its outputs. And to get into the dynamics is something where you start to see, I, I think one of the things that you noticed in the Secretariat is how long it takes for the council to evolve. There are very few revolutions. It's incremental as things change. Sometimes an elected member is on the council and doesn't see the seed that they planted bear fruit until long after they've left. So just the whole idea of getting an insider's look is so important. Um, one of the things you brought up that no one really talks about is the substance of the, what the council's work is um, in the fact that it is the worst of the worst of what human beings do to each other. And the council is dealing with that on a daily basis in very gruesome details. And I've seen in the secretariat that it can tend to almost at once that seemed to have been your experience when one day you realize this is a mental health issue. And I appreciated that you put that in your book to alert other people and the fact that you took steps to deal with that and also cared about the impact on your team. I think that's really important. Um, we've already mentioned briefly the press. Um, in the Secretariat, the press would be careful, I mean, sorry, the Secretariat would be careful to let a president know that during the month of their presidency, they're really fair game. At any moment, they can be approached, even at a restaurant, by a correspondent who is well-researched on a certain issue and really wants an answer. And Carl, something you did that was really important, I think, was to look at yourself on video and see how you spoke, see your body language, because not only is it your reputation, it's the reputation of your country and it's the reputation of the council. So I thought that was very helpful advice. I thought also it was important where you mentioned how quickly procedural problems could come up. And then you pointed out it doesn't happen only to elected members. You had one example when the Russian Federation was confronted with a procedural problem and the United States. I think that's very good to keep in mind and also what was alluded to today, where those procedural issues are worked out is important. Is it WhatsApp between the political coordinators? Is it in the consultations room? Is it in the chamber? That can actually make a difference. And um, I would want to otherwise go into the split term a lot more. Um, this was a unique split term because it was a split term between two members of the same regional group. In the past, they had been different regions. But I think there was a real onus on you in particular doing that second year to really make the transition a smooth one so it wouldn't seem like there were six incoming members and that there would be less cohesion, less effectiveness. And I think you get real credit for making that transition and as the finish would say, really hitting the ground running. Great. So I would just say well done for your term and well done for your book. Great, thank you, thank you, Lorraine, all, all your important perspectives. We've only got five minutes on our, on our scheduled time and I, I think we're gonna start losing people, but if we could take another maybe five, four or five minutes, uh, that would be great. We've still got a, a, a number of people that I'd like to get uh, their perspectives. Uh, next, uh, Mansoor, Kuwait, um, Amira, Bessiana, Vanessa, Jonas, and Tay. Um, if, if possible, just keep your remarks to, to two minutes. Um, that would be appreciated. Mansoor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam, and uh, for organizing uh, this event with uh, Carol. Carol, congratulations for your uh, book. Uh, you know, we were next to each other during your membership. And uh, what I can say that you really, your performance was uh, outstanding and uh, you were highly disciplined and we learned from each other a lot. And I'm glad that we joined you in one of your uh, achievements. Uh, I, I saw from your, uh, from your PowerPoints that, you know, one of your achievements is to ban the use of starvation uh, on, uh, on, uh, on war as a tool. Uh, we were uh, we joined you on this, uh, and I'm really glad to hear that you also mentioned in your book uh, the death, uh, the unsudden 
an untimely death of our uh, colleague, uh, Bernard. And this is what I did actually also in, in, in my book. I dedicated part of it. I mentioned the story. I knew him from, uh, from before. And it was really, it has emotional impact on, on all of us during our uh, membership. I will be very brief. Uh, I will touch on the topic of strengthen the cooperation among uh, the elected 10 members uh, known as uh, E10. Uh, there was a great improvement the last couple of years. And I believe uh, we can, uh, the E10, they can empower themselves and uh, they can be uh, constructive uh, in the council. That they, they should be united, but united not against the P5, united to uh, carry on the mandate of the Security Council uh, to make the council more effective and efficient and transparent. They can do that. And uh, one, uh, there, are, there are many examples that we were succeed, we succeeded actually in that. We had meetings among, among ourselves, a monthly luncheon, joint uh, press stakeout, joint statement. We did actually a lot, and I hope that this cooperation and this dialogue and uh, coordination will, will continue. Uh, one more thing. Uh, I, I just want to remind also the current E10 members to continue with, with the consultation, uh, to organize consultation with the incomers. Uh, Sweden, South Africa did that in Pretoria, uh, 2018. Uh, Belgium, Kuwait, Tunisia did that in 2019, and Kuwait and St. Vincent and Grenadine did that in 2020. I hope this kind of consultation will continue because we learn from each other. The exchange view is very, uh, you know, very useful. E10 can, you know, the council can benefit from E10. And uh, they shouldn't be intimidated. We should be united and we should push, you know, the, you know if you want to participate in the decision making, you have to be united and efficient and well, and well prepared for the membership. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, is, um, is Amira, UAE DPR, or are you still with us, Amira? Okay, there you are. Yes. That's the Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, excellencies, colleagues, uh, I would like to thank IPI for uh, organizing this webinar and also thank Ambassador uh, Carol for his illuminating uh, presentation and congratulate him on the publishing of uh, his book. Uh, the Netherlands demonstrated that elected members can and should take the initiative to enhance the council effectiveness and ensure that it discharges its mandate of uh, maintaining international peace and security. Um, I'm interested to hear from Ambassador Carroll about his experience with eating coordination when it comes to drafting resolutions. Uh, for example, the Netherlands worked with Côte d'Ivoire on peacekeeping related resolutions. Uh, so could you share some lessons learned about drafting resolutions with fellow E10 uh, members and how can the role of the E10 be further uh, enhanced taking into account the diverse nature of this group? My, last, my, my other point with the wider ranging list of agenda items before the council, I would be interested also to know how the Netherlands uh, identified uh, on which priorities uh, to focus uh, while serving on the council. I thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, I've got uh, a, a few more on, on my list. I've got Bessiana, Vanessa, Jonas, and Ty. If uh, we can be very brief, we'll give Carl a chance to, uh, to wrap up and respond to some of these excellent questions. Uh, please, Bessiana, the floor is yours. Uh, yes. Hi, everyone uh, from Albania, where I'm on vacation, but I've got the book of Carl that I am reading with a lot of interest. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's extremely useful uh, for us um, upcoming members in the Security Council uh, this meeting. I had a quick question for Carl. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you became a member, was there anything that you discovered was very different from what you thought uh, it would be while preparing for the Security Council. So something that nothing had prepared you for. So thank you. Uh, excellent, sharp, sharp question. Thank you so much. Then we'll move to another uh, potential upcoming member, Vanessa Fulvalta. 
With Bessiana, I'm on holiday also, and I just arrived in Malta also with the book, uh-huh. which is <laughs> going to be everybody's summer reading. It's our textbook, I think. But she, she stole my question. It's exactly what I wanted to ask, because first, Geraldine asked one of the questions that I wanted to ask, mm-hmm. too. Uh, but yes, this is what I would be really interested to know what's the thing that took you most by surprise and you wish you knew beforehand. And also, being another EU member that's going to be on the Security Council, um, Hopefully, it looks like we are because we're a clean slate um, and we will be the only other European with France. I would like to elaborate maybe a bit more on the role of an elected pan and EU country. Thank you. Yeah, there's this whole, whole chapter in the book on Europeanization and this question of Europe that is of definite interest here. Uh, finally, I've got, I've got Jonas in Switzerland and Tay, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll throw it over to Carl. Jonas, please. Yeah, thank you. Also speaking from a European, though non-EU yes, country, and together with Malta also, uh, next in line for the election in two years from now. So uh, thanks a lot. Also very interesting for us to hear, uh, to hear all those points. Uh, and also looking forward to read the book. Also we, in the great memory of the collaboration we had with the Netherlands while they were on the council and, and we were uh, still in the waiting room on, on, on POC and on many issues. One issue where we were really like and still are like-minded with Netherlands and others is the inclusion of civil society. And I had a question on that. What would be kind of your lessons learned on that? We've seen the backlash on the big pictures on, on human rights and also the inclusion of human rights discussion at the council. Uh, I remember there was also uh, during your presidency a uh, procedural vote on that. Uh, I guess it's in your book as well uh, on, on, on the briefing by the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, on, uh, on on Syria, that was that was that was last uh, vote that was last. What would be kind of your your advice on on, on like-minded countries that are coming for the council to kind of try to keep that agenda, uh, civil society and, and human rights issue uh, at the council? Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, and finally, our our, our last uh, speaker for Ethiopia, Tai. Please thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam, for organizing this event. Uh, uh, Carl, uh, thank you very much for the uh, publishing the book. Uh, and you're not the only one who are uh, uh, having uh, an orange tie. Uh, <laughs> I used to have that also. You know. uh, so uh, thank you very much. My uh, just quick advice for the incoming uh, members is that uh, you know, definitely there is a, a, a stepping learning curve, uh, the initial stage, uh, but after three months, it will get better and straightforward. So uh, get relaxed, it is not a problem. And the most important thing is, it is absolutely important that New York and your capital should be on the same page and speak with one voice. Otherwise, you'd end up to be a Spanish piñata for anyone, particularly for the P5s. Uh, we have seen a number of uh, ups and downs uh, and uh, a very difficult time along, along that line. So uh, that is very important. And the third po- point is that know when to be vocal and active and when uh, one's role can make difference in very uh, key and substantial issue. We assume that the P5 know everything, but they don't. They would rather spend their time on procedural matters. Many of the issues are, 70% of the issues are African issues. There are interests, we know that, but that doesn't necessarily mean they know everything. So uh, that's where you can make uh, differences. And the last point, as Mansour and all my colleagues has mentioned, is about ETN. Uh, Carl and myself, we organized the last ETN luncheon for the Secretary General together with an Ethiopian and, uh, and also uh, uh, a tasty European uh, dish. So uh, that's a very, very interesting platform. At least that could be a platform where you can air your collective indignation and disappointment and rage toward the sway uh, you know, uh, of taking the moment uh, and expressing how disappointed we are. 
So uh, the E10 is very, very important. And uh, you should make sure that it's up and running with vigor and stamina. Thank you very much once again, appreciate that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kyle. We, we're, we're over time, but I think that for the purposes of the, of the webcast, it's fine, this will be recorded. Um, some people might have to drop out, but I think there's a lot on the table, a lot of direct questions and, and, and petitions for advice. So if you could uh, take a few moments to, to respond. Um, well, thanks very much. Well, if I listen to the questions, I'm very happy I wrote my book because many of the issues addressed are in my book. No kidding. Uh, and that's why I also um, encourage all of those now in the council, take notes and write a book. Very shortly, Francisco, bring the outside world into the council, either with the PBC or civic society. Do it. Really do it. It gives an outside perspective. It makes clear that it's not these 15 people around the room who rule the world. No, it's the outside world counts. And it also makes the connection to what I said in the beginning, you want to have impact on the ground. Um, second on James, uh, how to handle a different news cycle. James, first of all, yes, the first time you asked me a question in an off the record briefing and you shouted to me like it was an open session press takeout, man, you can be intimidating. And I was writing about you in my book when I said, you have no idea about the impact of your beautiful, warm, dominant, low voice. Uh, the different news cycle is complicated. Um, we try to make sure, and this is a point that Taya made as well, to make sure that, count, that Capital and New York are connected. We had lines to take. I write in my book about the fact that even telling, if I do not know something, is also useful. Uh, I explained about, there was a rumor that the North Korean minister would participate in a debate, and me telling and honestly saying, I do not know, is much better than no comment, which I hear sometimes colleagues do, which doesn't work. Um, then the question about the EU, the E10 uh, of Richard, uh, I, uh, you know, there's a whole chapter on it in the book. Um, more EU cooperation is crucial. Why did we fight so hard to get Ireland into the council? Because else, when Albania comes into the council uh, after next year, it would have only be France from the European Union, which would have been in the council. So for us to have Ireland in there was a crucial uh, national interest. But there was a huge difference. When I was in the council with Olaf and Joanna and uh, the French and the, the English, we had five European Union members there. Uh, what we have tried to build, and that is continuing, is more institutional cooperation, that if you are there as an elected member, you can profit from the whole institutional framework from the EU, have better cooperation, and even have a seconded European Union official in the team now of Germany. Uh, that really is a difference, and I think we're going to build on that. Karen, all your points are so valid. Uh, uh, on a personal note, I hate competitive elections. It was bizarre. I had to fight against my Italian and my Swedish friends. Also, the last uh, election, it was it was such a pity that uh, uh, Canada, Norway, and Ireland had to fight each other, whereas the basic value systems these countries represent is basically identical. And um, no, I do not agree that it leads to a high level of readiness. Uh, no, on the contrary, uh, we waste so much energy in a, an enormous campaign that um, uh, certainly for Italy to, to enter at that moment was a, was a big step. We profited paradoxically enormously of the split term because we had, we worked, we, we spoke so much to the Italians. We had a Dutch diplomat in Rome. We had a Dutch diplomat here in the Italian mission that worked very well. Uh, but it was a, um, uh, I, I would have preferred, of course, like uh, Sebastian as well, to have been there two years. Uh, Security Council, other institutions um, fully agree. International Court of Justice, we brought the council to, uh, to The Hague, I think five years ago, exactly for that purpose. For us, the moment that the council could not agree on accountability for killing of more than half a million people in Syria, Together with Liechtenstein, Qatar, and Canada, we brought it to the General Assembly, and we got a triple IM. So there, if if the council is blocked, go to the to the GA. When um, uh, accountability, the joint investigative mechanism, was vetoed in the council for chemical weapon use in Syria, uh, with other like-minded countries, we moved it to OPCW. Uh, also, like um, you know, if if the council is const constantly blocked, it makes itself irrelevant. Um, Lorraine, uh, let's continue our conversation. I really appreciate all your com comments. Uh, you're, I think, the most expert colleague I've ever spoken to on the council. 
Um, thank you so much. We will we'll go to your conversation. On the drafting of a resolution, uh, the question from UAE, um, that's always a, a complicated process. What we did with the E10, and I think Kyra, you did it for the first time, first launch a resolution after drafting with your friends in the E10. I think that works very well. Instead of having it stuck at expert level, share it with the colleagues and, and ask advice of each other. You make each other stronger. How to choose your priorities? Um, for us, it was very political. We had, uh, in my book, I explained about our DNA. We had 10 priorities and we got a new government and we basically told them we can only have three. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sucker for the number three. Uh, and uh, my minister at the time chose th three. And it's a complicated process and it's a mix about your ideals and what is realistic and that balance you have to find. Um, Bessiana, um, my biggest surprise in my book was I never realized that I would lose my seat after one month. Um, when um, uh, after one month, the seats rotate. So uh, suddenly Gustavo, my Peruvian colleague was in my seat. I didn't realize it. I was like, shit, I, I campaigned for four years to get into the council. Somebody takes my seat. So be careful of that after one month, you lose your seat. Um, uh, Switzerland fully agree. We also worked very intensively on conflict and hunger. And finally, Taye, the connection between capital and um, New York is crucial. And I confess with your predecessor, there's a chapter in the book where I quarreled with your predecessor about that we went behind your back uh, to Addis Ababa uh, on um, uh, conflict and hunger. And uh, so I was guilty of that as well. My final remarks, just a few. Um, uh, uh, again, this conversation, I think, proves that it's useful to do this. Um, uh, I pay tribute to the work of uh, Lorraine, of Karen, of Richard, uh, of James, uh, Pamela and Margaret and all the colleagues. This is useful. Um, I, have, I, have, I have two things more to say. First, Adam, can I challenge you to organize this next year again uh, in, without me, but with the same group of people or similar kind of people, just do it like this. Um, because on the one hand, all these preparation meetings are always internal. I think to show to the world how it works in practice is useful for everyone. Uh, and I know that many of our colleagues from outside are looking in and thinking, okay, I'm 10 years down the line. Okay, so how does this, this work? So I, I, I challenge you, Adam, to do it next year. And my last point, and that's quite emotional, this might be my last event I do with IPI. I pay tribute to what the International Peace Institute has been doing and is continues to do. You are marvelous. Uh, you, your name is wonderful, International Peace. Uh, and that's what you try to achieve. And doing it in this way, uh, it's really amazing. And on a personal level, my friends, uh, when I leave in four weeks to London, I'm going to miss you so much. And don't underestimate how special all of you are and privileged you all are to be able to this way work and to make the world a little bit more safe, more secure, and more sustainable for all the people in the world. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kyle. That is a really uh, wonderful final words, and I really appreciate the nice words that, uh, that you gave to IPI there. You know, it strikes me, listening to you, what, uh, what in the, towards the end of your book, uh, you, you note that the Nike motto, just do it, or you served as sort of your guideline. In some way, listening to this conversation, listening to all the challenges uh, but also all the encouragement for E10 members and incoming members to, to not back down, to never fear, uh, to just just uh, uh, fight the good fight and, and move ahead is really, really important. And that, of course, the role of the E10 to cooperate together is, is what is key to doing that. Uh, we're all counting on you. And uh, I, I take up the challenge. I hope to do this again next, next year. Um, and uh, just want to say then, um, I hope this has been helpful um, and to made a contribution as you are engaging in your preparations for next year. It's been really interesting for me, a lot of substance. Uh, and thank you really, really from the bottom of my heart for participating uh, today. So with that, I will sign off. Thank you so much.